You have a story in The Economist about CEOs. We do. Our cover this week outside the U.S. In the U.S., we have the Democratic Party, but outside the U.S., it's how to be a CEO. Hmm. And uh, it, it's an interesting story. It's, but there's a big backing piece, which is looking at the headhunting industry. But the actual the, the, the cover editorial makes the point that um, to be a CEO now is not a bad job, right? The, you know, the median earnings for the CEO is $13 million for the Fortune 500 and S&P 500. That's median, not That average. is median, wow. $13 million a year. Um, so not a, and you also have much longer job tenure than people think you do. The risks of retiring or being fired are about 10 percent a year. It's not, it's not that high. Uh, but the nature of the job is changing. And one of the interesting things that I found in this piece was that traditionally CEOs wielded their power through their ability to allocate capital. Think of Jack Welch. Think of, you know, what you, you, you close a factory here, you open one here, you close a division here, you open one here. In a modern company where intangibles are so much more important, capital allocation is no longer the kind of key disciplining tool you've got. It's a much more amorphous. Secondly, you know, you no longer, it's no longer fashionable just to work for the shareholders, right? You have stakeholders across the board. You've got to worry about your employees. You've got to worry society. You've got to worry about your customers. So it's become a much more amorphous job. And those two things together, I think, mean that, you know, the nature of being a CEO is changing. But I think, judging by what we've got, it's still a pretty cushy thing to do. So, Glenn, as an economist, does that justify higher compensation? Because those people are more rare, and it's a difficult, they're, more difficult job. They're very rare, and there's a competitive market for their talents. I, I'm not sure I would describe it as cushy. It's actually <laughs> quite hard to be able to manage all those constituencies. I, I think of CEOs as people who are navigating disruption in their industries. They have to be strategic thinkers. They have to build strong teams, and they have to manage boards and shareholders and and uh, outside interests. I, I think it's not so easy to do. That $13 million do you think, is pretty well do you earned. Think, yeah, do you think CEOs deserve their compensation? I think if the market says that's the demand for CEO talent, then yes. Well, but is do. the market influenced to some extent by who's on the compensation committee and who's on the board and the extent to which the CEO yeah, has is, relations with them? That is commonly glam. said, but when you look at private equity CEOs who only have to deal with a very sophisticated private equity player, their compensation is also very, very high. So I think it's really the market. Okay, so let's talk about something that's really stirred up a lot of people in New York. I know certainly in my family, global entry. President oh, yeah. Trump, the Trump administration says we're going to cut you off if you're from New York, from global entry. I received word of that this morning. <laughs> and I'm about to make a, a trip overseas soon. Yes, it's, it's a rare action for the U.S. to do. And it's actually part of a more general strategy of going after sanctu so-called sanctuary cities and states uh, and their policies. So this may not be the last. Yeah, to, to explain it, I guess, a little bit, what their rationale is, if you're letting these people in, these undocumented aliens, they may be more dangerous, and you're not vetting them su sufficiently. So uh, New Yorkers, we don't trust quite as much, because you might have some of those coming in and out of the country. I guess that must be the, <laughs> the logic. I, I hope I'm a trustworthy soul in glo global entry. And of course, the machines are broken a lot anyway. <laughs> so I have a slight schadenfreude here. I mean, I think global entry, the ability to, to sign up to this program and then come very quickly through U.S. Uh, Border control is a tra has been transformational for me. It's amazing. I used to spend as long with everybody else who didn't wasn't a U.S. citizen. You know, hours and hours in the queue. Um, this is one of the few occasions where the administration has picked on New York and not foreigners. So I have to say I'm delighted about this. If you're going to do, no, I'm not. It's not very good policy, but well, it, it is one actually oddly that doesn't doesn't uh, affect us. If you're. But Glenn, I'm curious about the politics of it. I mean, you served in a Republican administration, and traditionally Republicans have believed that states should have some autonomy in deciding how they handle their citizens. This is basically the federal government in Washington dictating to New York how it should handle its citizens. That's not normally what I think of as as a Republican position. It's not normally, but let's also remember that the actual issue of terrorism is a big deal. And this is going to be a continued discussion between states and the federal government. I think the administration is went it, too far. Is this really, but is this really that, is it a sort of serious policy? So isn't it just the president saying, New York, you know? Yeah. I mean, Get stuff. As an election yeah. company, I mean, we had this, the, the state and local tax, the SALT thing that really hit New York, Connecticut, California. Is it just coincidence that those states really didn't vote for him? He's not going to lose a lot of voters in those states. He's not, but the state and local tax deduction is something that economists have talked about it's a long time. I'm a New Yorker, so you know it, it hits me, but frankly, it was still good policy. 